We have been working with others to create resilient and sustainable communities that are able to adapt to a changing climate. Some of our projects include the £3.6 million Climate Adaptation Silly Project, Long Rock Flood Defence and the St Austell Bay Resilient Regeneration Projects. The Forest for Cornwall, which aims to create 8,000 hectares of woodlands, hedges and trees. And a project on Bodmin Moor, which is restoring peatland. And there's much more happening locally. I wanted to talk about how vital it is that we all take action over the climate emergency. So at West Country Rivers Trust, we can work closely with our partners like the Wildlife Trust and South West Water to deliver programmes like Upstream Thinking to help farmers adapt their farms to the impacts of climate change and help us as a society with the impacts, but also to mitigate um, against greenhouse gas emissions. We can also help in monitoring our environment. So we run programs like citizen science investigations that allows individuals to take ownership of their local river and understand what in it and how it's being pressured as our climate changes, working with farmers across the catchment to try and reduce flood risk, reduce water um, uh, pollution issues and also increase base flows all the time, sequestering carbon into our soils and mitigating for the impacts of climate change. From a business point of view, we're organic growers. We have um, solar panels, so the amount of energy that we produce is about equivalent to the amount we use per year. Yeah, our groundwater uh, supplies are threatened by the predicted rise in sea level and we're finding it increasingly difficult to grow food crops. For the farm we collect rainwater. We have about 100 cubic metres of storage and even with our rainwater catchment we would be having severe problems if we lost any of our additional groundwater. Our teams have been supporting Cornwall Council and the other stakeholders and partners for the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder has provided some fantastic um, resources and tools to help homeowners and business owners understand uh, their flood risk and understand a little bit more about property flood resilience. The Southwest Climate Change Centre at Heartlands in Cornwall. They have been designed specifically to help visitors understand a little bit more about the effects that climate change is going to have on our weather. One room has been specifically designed uh, in partnership with Carbon Neutral Cornwall to help people understand and see firsthand some of the challenges uh, that climate change is having on the southwest and some of the adaptations that you can make in your own home uh, to better prepare for that. Good morning everyone, um, my name is Carolyn Cadman and I'm Chief Executive of Cornwall Wildlife Trust and as of next year Cornwall Wildlife Trust will have been um, looking after and protecting Cornwall's wildlife for 60 years so we've got a good track record in wildlife and things that are good for wildlife are also good for tackling climate change so um, that's why I'm here today. Um, I'd like to um, welcome Wes Smith who is uh, the um, lead speaker for this session. Wes, if you'd like to turn your um, microphone and camera on. Um, Wes is Natural England's area manager for Devon, Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And I'd also like to welcome Lord Robin Teverson, chair of the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly Local Nature Partnership, who is our local advocate for this session, which is all about how we adapt and improve things, adaptation and mitigation in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and no doubt beyond. Um, 
So I'm going to invite Wes now to give his talk. Robin and, and I will um, turn ourselves off, so to speak, and we'll join you once Wes has finished, finished his presentation. Over to you, Wes. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, uh, I've been asked to talk about how we adapt and improve things um, uh, regarding the whole sort of climate change agenda. So about um, adaptation and mitigation, and um, I've been given 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's, uh, this will have to be a very quick canter through um, some of, some of uh, my thoughts around, around how we adapt and improve things uh, in the face of climate change. Um, so we, we know that the Earth's climate is changing. Um, we know it's as a result of human activities. And we also know that we're likely to see further and potentially more extreme changes uh, uh, in coming years. Um, but climate isn't the only crisis we face. Uh, we are also facing a parallel ecological crisis and addressing these twin crises uh, uh, will, is, is, um, is the key to, to addressing the whole sort of uh, um, way in which we respond uh, and adapt to climate change. So we can't address the climate change crisis without also addressing the parallel ecological crisis. Um, so when we talk about adaptation and, and mitigation, uh, what do we actually mean? Well, adaptation is about reducing the risk posed by climate change. Uh, and mitigation is about reducing the impacts. Uh, but they're two sides of the same coin. They're complementary strategies. Um, and what I want to talk about this morning is about the role of nature-based solutions, um, because uh, I believe that both uh, the nature-based solutions offer routes to both adaptation and mitigation in, in tackling these twin um, these twin crises that we face. Um, so, uh, why why nature based solutions? Well, nature is a sink for capturing carbon, um, and it also provides us with solutions for limiting the impact of carbon of climate change. Um, uh, Nature-based solutions, uh, as well as addressing climate change issues, will also help reverse some of the catastrophic declines that we've seen in biodiversity. Um, and importantly, they'll also help protect and maintain and restore some of those ecological services, ecosystem services that we all rely on. Uh, clean water, fresh air, uh, healthy soils to grow food uh, and raw materials. So um, nature-based solutions uh, offer us both solutions to uh, thinking about climate change, but they also offer us uh, an important complementary solution, which is around addressing some of the massive impacts that we've seen that have, uh, that have been behind the ecological crisis that we currently face. Um, uh, so adaptation, what do we mean by, by adaptation? Um, so that's about building the ecological resilience to climate change. Um, and ecological resilience is about uh, helping provide habitats and species and other environmental features, the ability to persist in the face of, of the inevitable climate change that we're now seeing. Um, uh, Nature-based solutions in, in thinking about adaptations uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, not only around uh, addressing the direct impacts that we'll see on climate change, but also about reducing those non-climatic factors that are currently undermining uh, the ecological uh, resilience of our natural world. And there's two uh, elements to those non-climatic factors that I'd particularly like to, to, to highlight in this, in this talk. One is pollution, and the second is habitat fragmentation. Uh, so why pollution? Uh, so pollution places massive stress on the natural environment. Um, 
we've all seen the sort of images about the most obvious sources of pollution, marine plastics, uh, oil spills, uh, and those sort of very visual impacts uh, as a result of, of pollution events. Um, but there are equally and, and um, more devastating impacts uh, that we don't necessarily see uh, as a result of the pollution of, 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 um, uh, that comes from the sort of human activity um, and the way in which we've structured our society over the last sort of uh, or since the, the Industrial Revolution. And um, uh, pollution, that, that sort of less visible pollution, really sort of impacts on the ability of, of uh, the natural world to respond uh, and adapt. And that will compound the challenges that we see around climate change. Um, uh, Perhaps one of the, the most obvious examples of that is around the sort of the changes in the qualities and quantity of, uh, of water uh, that supports our wetlands. Um, not just our freshwater wetlands, uh, but also many of our sort of uh, coastal and marine um, habitats and environments as well. Um, and, and, and of course, where, where, where we have found ourselves is that increasingly we're having to look at very sort of carbon hungry uh, uh, methods to, to address some of these pollution impacts um, uh, in terms of uh, providing for drinking water and so on. But that needn't be the case. Um, so if we were to think about uh, pollution in the water environment, actually a nature-based solution uh, where we start to think about how we manage our watersheds differently, how we restore the hydrology of our soils and wetlands, uh, how we increase tree cover and the benefits that has to soil runoff and, and um, uh, soil moisture how we better manage our soils and fertilizers, um, how we sort of uh, allow our floodplains to operate naturally, uh, how we build green infrastructure into our urban areas. These are all nature-based solutions that will help address some of that, um, uh, uh, the really sort of significant impact non-climatic factors are having. Um, and it must be uh, uh, part of the way in which we think about going forward. Um, uh, the other big non-climatic factor that's also impacting on the resilience of, of uh, the natural world's ability to respond to climate change is around habitat fragmentation. Um, uh, so we know in the natural world, actually size is important. Um, that larger species, larger populations of species, larger areas of habitat are much more robust. Uh, they're not going to be much more resilient to climate change. Uh, and also the ability uh, of those habitats and species to migrate and respond. Um, uh, we know that, you know, over the last sort of 150, 200 years, we've seen a huge um, reduction in the extent and distribution of ecosystems. And, and uh, that's not in faraway places, that's also here uh, uh, in, in, in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And, um, you know, and I would just reference at this point the, um, the Cornwall State of Nature report and some of the sort of startling statistics that you uh, that are highlighted in that report around how we've seen populations and, and habitats decline uh, in recent years and particularly since the 1970s. Um, uh, in 2010, uh, the Lawton Review. Uh, on making space for nature really highlighted the need for larger, better, more joined up wildlife sites as a way of responding uh, to climate change. And, and the recent uh, inclusion within the um, 
the Environment Bill of the reference to a nature recovery network starts to point uh, 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 us in the direction that we need to travel in terms of restoring nature and reducing the, the impact habitat fragmentation is having on our ability to adapt to climate change. So that's adaptation, thinking about two particular things in particular around non-climatic uh, effects that we, that we need to address. In terms of mitigation, um, perhaps the most important uh, aspect of that from a sort of nature-based solution perspective is around uh, carbon st storage or sequestration. Um, so mitigation, uh, outside of the nature-based solutions is about reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, uh, but I, what I particularly want to talk about is the capacity of the natural world to store carbon. Um, so we know that the natural world has this huge capacity in terms of uh, carbon storage, not only on land, you know, most obviously people have talked about um, rainforests, uh, 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 the importance of trees and peatlands, but also at sea, there is a huge capacity in the natural world to store carbon. Uh, and what we need to do is start to think about which, um, which, where the investment needs to be in those biological systems that are particularly important for carbon storage. So woodlands, uh, we've talked about, uh, or has been, has, has been talked about, and, and uh, there was reference earlier on in, in um, today's conference around the forest for Cornwall and the need to, to restore degraded woodland as well as planting new woods. Um, uh, uh, the session earlier on, if, for those of you that listened to around agriculture, you know, highlighted the importance of um, soil carbon. Uh, and we know that um, increasing the levels of organic carbon in soils um, uh, or organic matter in soils will improve the, the ability of those soils to store carbon. Um, uh, but as well as doing that, it also will improve soil fertility uh, and reduce our, our reliance on artificial fertilizers. And we've got some great examples in Cornwall where um, uh, farmers and uh, uh, the local authority and the NGO sector are working together on looking at how we improve soil health through catchment sensitive farming, through upstream thinking and so on. So, Again, another sort of nature-based solution that would help in the mitigation, uh, help in, in mitigation of climate change by increasing uh, carbon sequestration or storage. Um, we know how important peatlands are, um, and peat soils are found in a number of places in Cornwall, on Bodmin Moor, in Penwith, um, uh, there's shallow peat soils in, in mid Cornwall. Um, uh, so we need to invest and protect those, uh, those peatlands that we already have. And then on the coast, we've got salt marshes, seagrass beds, ocean sediments. Uh, these are all really important carbon stores. So restoring these coastal habitats is key to, to the mitigation of climate change. And it's you know, it's great to see some of the sort of proactive work that's going on on uh, seagrass beds on the Isles of Scilly, uh, in the Fallon Helford, uh, um, and in the uh, Plymouth Sound and the Tamar. And the other thing perhaps to mention about coastal habitats uh, is perhaps that we, you know, we're facing coastal change, we're facing sea level rise. So some of these habitats like salt marshes, as well as being hugely important in terms of carbon storage, also provide a sort of a level of resilience in, uh, in combating uh, things like sea level rise. Um, so it's been really encouraging, for example, to see uh, a series of managed retreat sites coming forward on the Tamar estuary to try and address the issues there of coastal squeeze 
and create new areas of intertidal habitat uh, that will have benefits for, for sort of, um, uh, not just for uh, uh, biodiversity, but also for some of the sort of uh, communities uh, that live in and around the Tamar Estuary. Thanks, Wes. Um, great overview of, of that. Um, Robin, I think you're now going to come back in and oh. I'm, going to, I'm going to step away, possibly just for 10 minutes, because we're running a little bit over. And I can see that the questions are coming through, which we'll, we'll come back to. But I'll, I'll leave you for 10 minutes. I'll come back at five past 12 and then we'll go through some of the questions that are OK, Carolyn, that's great. Yeah, please, please come back after 10 minutes and shut us up. That would be that would be good. It's important to move on to questions. Wes, thanks so much for for going through all of uh, that. I, I was at uh, a student um, uh, meeting about COP26 uh, last week, and one of the questions I was asked was what should be the balance of investment or work between um, between uh, mitigation and adaptation? And Although it sounds rather sort of academic-y sort of question, it's, it's an important one, isn't it? Because when I was in Parliament, when the Climate Change Act went through, adaptation, i.e. sort of getting ready for the, the um, for, for climate change to happen, was sort of like a, a sort of a badge of failure in a certain way, in that what we really needed was mitigation. So don't worry about adaptation, because that's just an excuse not to do anything if we sort of prepare for, for doom, doom will happen. J -j -j uh, but as time goes on, it gets more and more important, doesn't it, those, those adaptations? So, so what, 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 how, do you, how do you see that? And, uh, and, and do people realise that's enough? And it's expensive, isn't it? Um, well, in some ways, it is a bit of an academic argument because they're both two sides of, of the same coin. Um, uh, and and I and I think that you know um, you know one of the I suppose one of the sort of incredibly in, important and sort of coherent um, uh, things about nature based solutions is that you tackle both adaptation and mitigation at the same time um, and you know. The stresses that climate change will bring are really, really compounded by the non-climatic factors that are impacting on the natural world. So our ability um, to provide clean drinking water or our ability to sort of, um, uh, you know, protect ourselves uh, in terms of um, things like genetic resource going forward for you know, uh, new crops and, and improving the crops we grow, all of those things is being compounded by the fact that, you know, we're, we're uh, treating the natural world as if, as if it were a sort of uh, a resource that we didn't need to worry about going forward. Um, and no, I think, I think, that, I think Wes, let me stop you there, because I, I really like that. I, I think that's a really good message and one I didn't think of, which is that actually nature based solutions do both those, don't they? They do the both at the same time. And I, I think that's a, a really uh, strong message. You, we saw in the film and, and you mentioned it yourself about uh, peatlands. And I guess this is something that's coming more and more people are, are aware of. I, I, in fact, I looked at Natural England's website uh, just before this session and it said that 300 million tonnes of carbon are stored in England's, just England's, um, um, uh, peatlands. And I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how you think of 300 million tonnes of carbon, but that's that's amazing. But at the same time, if, if I go down to my local garden centre, I still see um, bags of um, peat or, or compost with peat for sale. Is, is that something we should avoid as individuals? And or It seems to me a, a very contrary message, and given the importance you give to peatlands. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that, um, you know, there's, you know, I think if, if you're still buying peat-based compost products, you know, there are some, you know, the, you you're having a sort of a direct impact on one of the most important carbon stores that we have in this country. So peatlands are quite uh, limited in their geographic extent around the world, but the UK has a really important peatland resource and about 
There's only about 20% of the peatlands in this country that have been unaffected by, by activity, whether that's through drainage, for peat extraction, or for agriculture, or, or so on. So um, uh, a hugely important part of, uh, of the contribution the UK can make to uh, carbon sequestration is, is in our peatlands, um, as well as actually in our wetlands. So if you think about the UK, I think it's about 10,000 square kilometers of wetland in the UK have been drained since the 1970s. Um, you know, and part of that was, you know, a huge push to, to Im improve uh, uh, food production, but it has been at the expense of some of these sort of ecosystem services that are key to our survival going forward. And that's true of meadows as well, isn't it? We sort of think of those as being sort of part of the, the British countryside, but uh, isn't it something like 99% of those have disappeared? And can, we, can, can we get those back? Or? Yeah, yeah, hugely. And I think that, you know, if, we, if um, you know, I'm old enough to sort of, uh, you know, reflect on the changes that I've seen in the countryside since, you know, since uh, uh, my childhood, and they have been absolutely unbelievable. You know, um, things that were once common, uh, you know, are now increasingly rare. And I think that, you know, there is a huge, um, uh, there is a huge sort of non-climatic factor around pollution and habitat uh, fragmentation that unless we address, we're not going to be able to uh, um, have that level of sort of resilience that will allow us to, to uh, confront the challenges of climate change. And it was really interesting to hear um, Alex Sharman uh, say at, at COP26, uh, yesterday or the day before, that, that restoring the natural world is our first line of defence uh, in, in facing up to the challenge of climate change. I mean, that's, that, that's a really important point you make, isn't it? Because, and, and, and Alex Sharma as well, but uh, we all know about the climate change crisis to some degree now, having talked about it for decades, and I, I think there's really strong public awareness of how important that is. But that parallel um, ecological emergency that you talked about, the retreat of nature, the lack of biodiversity, that one's, uh, and the two being absolutely in interrelated. I mean, here we are in Cornwall thinking we've got a, and in the Isles of Scilly, mm. thinking we've got fantastic environment. But as you say, it's just as depleted as, as other parts of the country and indeed the world, isn't it? It is. And, and unfortunately, we're one of the sort of... Um, one of the avenues that tends to go down when you talk about adaptation and mitigation is so often when people talk about adaptation, uh, they talk about, you know, building bigger and bigger seawalls to address the issues of climate change, pouring more concrete into uh, flood defence works or mitigation, you know, going through sort of um, carbon stripping, you know, uh, in power stations, actually, those are all hugely carbon hungry solutions in their own right. Uh, but if we invest in restoration of the natural world, uh, you know, not only will it deliver a better result, uh, but it also, uh, um, you know, addresses this other issue, which is around the ecological crisis, because technical solutions technical solutions to adaptation and mitigation will not address one of the uh, uh, the equally uh, challenging issue around the ecological crisis we face. And I think that often people think about the ecological crisis just about, you know, butterflies or birds or what have you, but actually these are, this web of life is fundamental to the ecosystem services that we all rely on. So it's a double win, is what we're what we're saying yeah. here. Yeah, that's a, that's a really really important message. Caroline, you've come in to shut us up, I think, have you? Well, I just there's lots of questions coming through, and and to yeah. give them justice, I thought I'd come back a bit earlier. Yeah. Um. There's some really common themes, and not surprisingly, coming through from the previous session. 
Um, and the first one I'll pick out, it's a hard one, but I'd be interested in your, your respective views on it, which is a question saying you can't solve problems with the same level of thinking that created them. How do we make these changes? And I think this goes back to what Stefan Bohm was saying about system change. Interested in your views on how we're going to solve these problems. Oh. Sorry, Karen, you faded a bit there. Oh. Um, so but, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Did I, you get the gist of it? I think so. I mean, you know, we as as a species, we know absolutely how to destroy the natural world. Um, uh, but we also have got uh, a pretty good idea of what we need to do to address it. I think the challenge is... Um, you know, and the challenge is not not only to us as individuals, but also to us as, as, as you know, as people who vote in governments. I mean, governments know know what to do. What they don't know what to do is how to make the difficult choices and still get reelected. And you know, and I think that one of the um, one of the things uh, we as citizens uh, and as people who who sort of uh, you know, can use the power of our of our, our 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 money and our democratic voice to do is to make sure that we support uh, uh, the difficult choices that are being made because they will have impacts on us as individuals. Okay, Robin, what's your? Yeah, I, I, I mean, in terms of these uh, crises uh, and, and and climate change and everything, I mean, there, there, I remember one of the. Uh, chief uh, advisors on climate change to the government some years ago saying um, if lots of people making a lot of small differences lands up making a small difference all in, in total. But I think it's not as straightforward as that. We, yeah, it, this has to work at every level. So, um, and Wes is absolutely right. Um, and it's not just democracies. I mean, there's a lot of um, research going on at the moment that shows po very positively that uh, people of all classes, of all um, right across the country, uh, of all ages, see the climate crisis as a one of the major, if not the major, threat uh, uh, to them and and to and to their families. But then, when you come down to say, well, how much are you willing to pay to stop that? Then that evaporates to a certain degree, and so. Now, I say that as progress. I think that other bit will, will come along as well. But we have to find uh, ways of doing it, maybe by changing the way taxation works, moving it to the things that uh, um, promote um, uh, helping climate change away from some of the, other, uh, some, from some of the others. So you can, you can move some of those things around. But we also need to respond as, uh, as individuals as well. But I guess none of us will be perfect. And of course, when it comes down to transport in Cornwall, and in uh, Scilly particularly, getting across from the mainland from Scilly, that's long, it's going to be carbon intensive to, to, to a degree. You can't get away from transport. You just can't walk everywhere. So we have all these challenges, but I think we have to do it um, at, at absolutely uh, every, every level. But yes, government needs to show a lead. But even in China, where you don't have uh, democracy in any way whatsoever, the the uh, the Chinese government, the Com Chinese Communist Party, sees itself the only, its legitimacy is delivering economic growth, and that comes first. And so it has the same problem. In order to show its legitimacy to its uh, population, it shies away. Although it's the biggest uh, investor in renewables and in, in globally, it still has that, those sort of dilemmas. Okay. Well, let, thank you for that. Let's um, move away from system change. Um, onto the subject of flooding. We all know climate change is bringing more intense rain activity, uh, more water flowing across our land and into the sea. Um, and there's been quite a few questions about flooding. And the one I'm gonna pick out now, I think, is about um, whether you know of anything that's being done and whether you have any suggestions of anything that should be done to reduce the cost of property flood resilience products make them more affordable to all property owners um, and perhaps others who provide property for others to rent. Um, maybe the, the social justice end of being ready for climate change. So, Robin, do you want to respond? Yeah, no, I, 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 Carolyn, you mentioned a really important area there, which is uh, social justice in that, uh, yeah, coming back to cars, electric cars, we would like to have electric cars because they're cheaper to run, but 
uh, they're very expensive to buy, and so that makes them rather exclusive on the whole to people with uh, with higher incomes. And there's this whole problem. Uh, we have a huge problem still with uh, uh, fuel poverty in this this country with low incomes. And so if we say decided to have green hydrogen for the whole of our um, uh, instead of uh, methane gas, then probably we'd quadruple the cost of, uh, of, of heating. And it's usually people uh, that can't afford that. They're also in the least efficient uh, energy efficient homes as well. So there is that, uh, that, 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 that whole area. In terms of flooding, I mean, the first thing that should be done is any new build, um, if preferably is away from uh, flooding zones. Secondly, if they're still at that risk, and there will be in the future, that they're built to be resilient. We still have uh, all sorts of building regulations that are really, in, in my mind, uh, two or three decades uh, old of, of how we... But the big issue around buildings is clearly the existing building stock. However many we build, most of properties are going to be ones that are going to be... Uh, uh, that are already there. And uh, I think there has to be taxation incentives uh, in, 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 in that area, uh, not just in terms of resilience for flooding, but actually making them more energy efficient. Now that's starting to happen in some of social housing, but we have to go beyond that. And that there is real cost. And uh, I think there's some fairly radical solutions there, but uh, we really have to start thinking about these things now. I mean, the village that I live near, uh, I, I, I live near Tregony, there's a, a village down the road uh, or a hamlet called Palmasic that suffered from uh, flooding a couple of times. And the human cost of that, I mean, it's absolutely um, uh, such a, a life-changing event if your house floods. So we have to take this uh, really, really seriously. And that was, that was solved in the end of the day. But part of that was developments, lots of concrete upstream, and lack of um, forest or um, trees or, or barriers to that water all coming down at the same time. And we can start to do that through the sort of nature-based solutions that uh, Wes has been talking about. Okay, Wes, is there anything more you want to add to that one? Um, I suppose the one point I would make is that, you know, we've increasingly divorced what happens in individual settlements from what happens in the... Um, in the land that surrounds them. And, um, you, you know, the, the, the emphasis is, is changing. So, um, you know, there's much more interest in things like um, natural flood management uh, as a way of sort of holding up water, slowing water, you know, and that's about, uh, 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 you know, restoring the way in which our floodplains operate. Um, uh, managing our, the watersheds differently through things like, you know, identifying where key areas to plant trees are, where key areas to, to sort of think about soil management are, so that we can try and reduce the pressure on, on communities downstream. And there are, you know, you know, I haven't mentioned, but, you know, we have the potential, I think, in the future for, you know, new ways of thinking about that, you know, so what could the role of beavers play, for example, in watershed management? And, you know, there's been some really interesting work done on the River Otter in Devon, which has looked at, at how beaver populations can actually change some of the flood profiles. So, um, you know, it doesn't always need to be hugely expensive. Uh, but it will have impact somewhere or other, and part of that impact will be around the way in which we think of our watersheds. Okay, um, let's move away from the land. Um, and no one mentioned Cornish hedges, which of course are a, a natural uh, solution to, to water management across our landscape. But um, let's move away from the land to the marine environment. Um, we've had a question about... Um, wind farms potentially having a negative effect on marine wildlife. Um, so, and we know there are proposals in Cornwall and Scilly and in Cornish uh, for um, development of offshore renewable wind um, that are on the table. So, let's um, pause on wind farms potentially having a negative impact on marine wildlife. Robin. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. As there's uh, some proposals going forward at the moment for 
so-called floating offshore wind, which always rather boggles my mind, seeing the thinking of these uh, great turbines, and they are huge, the sort of size of the Eiffel Tower or whatever, um, not being anchored to the ground that way, but actually floating. Um, no, there's, there's um, so there here we have this dilemma between climate change, clearly we want renewable energy like wind, and the effects it might have on the environment. And I think, I mean, a couple of things that uh, I've been involved in perhaps on here is underwater, then there's issues potentially about uh, um, noise uh, around the seabed uh, disturbance. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, a concern also of our fishing industry of, of how that might re re restrain their their economic well-being. But I think uh, I think a couple of things are really important on here. One is unlike the North Sea, which has lots and lots of offshore wind at the moment, when we have cables all over the place and uh, and also coming ashore in multiple places uh, as well. I think we have to have a proper grid there um, if, if we have these uh, turbines in the Celtic Sea, which I think overhaul we do want, but we want to make sure it doesn't hurt our, our natural environment. So we need to prove that we have a proper planned grid and learn from the North Sea mistakes in that area. But the other area, obviously, is clearly migration routes on 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 uh, birds, not just uh, seabirds, but uh, those that are migrating. And we need to do a lot, lot, lot more research over that and understand that. Um, it takes a long time to uh, to plan and build these things. So we've got time to do that research and make sure migration routes are, uh, uh, on the whole are fairly predictable. And so we need to make sure that we get that uh, right as well. And I believe there is that sort of sweet spot between getting that very important renewable clean energy into the country and actually making sure that we really give a, a priority to natural systems as well at the same time. Mm. Wes, anything to add on that? Uh, I mean, just, just, just a couple of sort of thoughts. So one is that, you know, I think politically one of the huge attractions about offshore wind is that it's stopped, you know, what government might describe as the NIMBY vote uh, because it's become out of sight, out of mind. But there is an ecological um, balance to be made. And, you know, if you, if you think about the North Sea and the, the Irish Sea, you know, areas that are hugely important for wintering seabirds, um, you know, and uh, as, as well as sort of cetaceans and so on. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the long term solution to this is not thinking that we can still continue to have this energy hungry lifestyle and for it not to have an impact somewhere along the line. So um, in terms of both uh, where we put these things, you know, I don't think we should we should just sort of try and think that the solution to this is put them somewhere where I don't have to look at them. Um, you know, we, you know, if we want energy, you know, we need to accept that that comes that comes with a cost. And and what's the cost we as a society are prepared to, to pay? And I think, you know, uh, uh, offshore wind does not come without uh, potential impacts on the natural environment. And we just need to understand that. And, and some of those impacts might be less if if turbines were built on land. I think, Wes, if I can say, it's a really important point, is that energy efficiency, rather than producing more capacity, is the cheapest way to solve uh, the, uh, the energy issue, let alone the climate one. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the list of questions. Um, and, you know, we've heard a lot from um, government and in the Environment Bill about measures that are being introduced to... Uh, manage development or sort of help ensure that development brings po nature positive actions. Um, but that's over and above what happens already. And the, the question is, how can we stop rogue developers from destroying invaluable habitat and carbon sinks? Current legislation permits developers to continue this destruction. Um, we've had some high profile cases recently in Cornwall. I'm not so familiar with what's happening on the Isles of Scilly, but um, Wes, I don't know if you want to take this one first. Um, and this, by the way, I should say, the, the people behind the scenes have told me that this was the most liked question from, from those that have been submitted. So, so I, 
I'm sorry, Kara, I didn't catch that all, but I think it's about how do we stop rogue developers, is that right? Um, so, um, you know, how do you stop anybody that wants to, um, I suppose, uh, act out of sync or, or, or act in a non-compliant way with the legislation, you know, it is, it's really difficult. It's a challenge, you know, that society faces in all sorts of aspects. I, I think one of the things that's, that's changed uh, dramatically over the last uh, few years is a recognition that uh, development needs to contribute positively to biodiversity. Um, so we've got things like the biodiversity net gain metrics that have come in. Uh, the environment bill puts a, a requirement on local authorities to produce nature recovery, uh, local nature recovery strategies. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways in which actually uh, the planning system is transforming and improving how it thinks about its impact on the natural world. Um, uh, uh, you know, and all of that is hugely positive, along with, you know, something I mentioned earlier, which is around investment in green infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, we increasingly understand the role that uh, the environment plays to the health and well-being of communities um, and the importance of access to things like green space. Uh, so it is at a sort of, um, I suppose, at a regulatory level, you know, things are, are much more positive now than they've been for a long time. Uh, in terms Why of clean road rogue uh, developers um, I mean I suppose that's just the degree to which we want to support and fund local authorities in terms of enforcement action because they would be the regulator. Okay Wes thank you thank you for that response I think we're now at time it's 12.20 um, I understand so thank you Robin, for your contribution. Thank you, Wes, for your for yours and your, your your speech at the beginning. Hopefully, you can hear me now, and it's not too much of an extreme close up for everyone. Um, uh, so, yes, um, all of this session has been recorded, so people can watch it later on. Um, the, the people behind the scenes have captured some the, the various bits of Zoom chat, so that's going to be recorded and looked at as well. Um, thanks for everyone for coming. Um, there's now a short lunch break from 12.20 till 12.45. Um, please join us at, back at 12.45 and there'll, there'll be two sessions, one on transport um, and the other stream is on your business journey to net zero. So uh, join us back at 12.45, but thanks again for your time and I hope you enjoyed the session. <laughs>